Okay, so uh, I've had a need to package uh, Django applications or web applications in general, whether that be Django, Flask, or any other sort of Python based web application. Um, my need I'll get into, but uh, I've developed a project called Saucer that I don't know is actually a thing, and so that's the point of coming here to see how you guys do this. If it's something that's a need out in the ecosystem, and if the thing I created or forked off of something that already existed has any value. So, um, in a perfect world, we would all use Heroku because they have Git push and it just deploys and restarts your services and everything works great. Um, but the reality is, a lot of clients don't, won't, or can't use Heroku for their own reasons. Um, and so they have other options like uh, cloud hosting, which most of us use anyways, um, or bare metal, which is my client's need. They actually have physical servers still. Um, so how do we deploy? Well, typically we use Fabric. Uh, Fab deploy, we have a big long deploy script that does a bunch of stuff, probably runs tests, probably runs pylint, probably um, moves some JS and, and compiles that and does a bunch of stuff. Um, but that's really some legacy shit and we needed something new. Uh, the reality was we had a lot of stuff that needed to happen as a result of this. So I'm gonna come up here and kind of explain this. So this is our um, build command uh, and these are the steps. I don't have all the code because it's a lot of code, but basically we have to check out the code, install some JS libs, compile some static files, run pylint, uh, count our code lines, tag a release, create an artifact, move the artifact to a deploy uh, directory and then export a tag name uh, as an environment variable. That's just building the asset and then deploying it, we had to transfer the artifact, uncompress it, switch a symlink, run migrate, reload a uh, supervisor, probably also run some, uh, some, some move static media or something like that. It, it's a lot of stuff in a fabric command. And the reality was for this client, they had a different one of these files for every single one of their projects. Um, the reason for that is that Fabrics kind of sucks to share between projects. You could have it as a gist and check it out and then run the command, but then you always have a different gist compiling your code differently. You could use some other tools and I'll get into those options later. Um, but the real interest here for me is the build part and that's because my client had a, a lot of very specific needs. So they're in a totally closed environment. Their servers don't have access to the internet, at least where they deploy them to. The reason for that is this is an internal application. But where they build them, they do have access to the internet. Um, so, and, and that's only a kind of. There's a lot of internal um, dependencies that are built where they need to deploy stuff or, or include as part of the package. And so we have some internal stuff. We have access to PyPy and the build server, um, but the server itself doesn't have the internet. So we needed to build an asset that had all of our dependencies, um, all of our you know, requirements.txt local to that asset. Um, they also have a lot of demands around what's in that asset. And the reason for that is that because the developers are not their ops. They don't practice DevOps. They actually have operations. Operations doesn't have code. They don't know code. They're not coders. They're ops guys. They're a bunch of Linux guys. They know how to move a file and untar a file and restart a service. And that's what they're used to. Um, they don't understand Fabric. They don't know what it does. They kind of know Python. They could investigate it. But the reality is when a new deploy needs to happen, they just want to press a button and here's a new code and it just works. Um, they have a lot of web projects um, that have a lot of different shared deployment dependencies, shared processes, shared stuff. Um, they also have a lot of dependency management needs. Again, internal PyPy, external PyPy, public. Um, but their real need is around making sure that those assets that they've compiled in one environment get moved up to other environments in the exact same manner. So it's a very rigid build and deploy process. So if you say, I'm going to build master and master is version X, version X gets deployed to dev and tested, QA and tested, prod and run. They want to make sure that exact same artifact is moved between each environment. The only difference might be environment variables that sets database and other stuff that might be environment specific. Okay, so if we're not gonna use Fabric, or Fabric's not necessarily the right option because of a lot of other needs that we have, I wanted to see what else was out there. Uh, so again, standardized Fab script has its own shortcomings. I didn't think it was the right option. Um, 
we also want to implement CI. So we use Jenkins, which is great for running things, but not so good at versioning and sharing scripts. Again, like, I want something that I can have for one project, but also have for 20 projects. Um, Jenkins is good for that, but then you have to use parameterized builds, which are really weird. They also have their own um, domain, like, scripting language that's written in Groovy, and it's kind of ugly, and I don't like Java anymore, so I don't do that. Um, so I decided that Jenkins is probably good for deploying it, but not for building it. Um, and so the next option was, well, let's look at Python packaging. Right, we're writing Python code. Why not use packages? Um, I mean, I, Python packaging sucks, right? We all know that. Like, there's all this shit that doesn't really make sense about packaging. It, it works really well if you have like a Python library, but we're talking about a web application that's got like static media and templates, and it's got configuration files. It's got all sorts of stuff that's not actually Python code. And I didn't really know how that was going to work. So I investigated it further. Um, I didn't really know what I was going to deploy. Is this is it source code? Is it is it a binary? In the end, today, prior to this new process that I'm investigating and developing as we talk, um, we always uh, distributed wheels because they're fast, because it's already compiled, because all the code's local, all the dependencies that the wheels already need are in our PyPy, so I can just move that. So I was like, okay, well, I'll build a wheel, but it's source code. I don't really want to compile Python and have all of this weird templates and static media living within that. So I was like, okay, I'll do an SDIS. Um, but again, these all come with their short com shortcomings around the idea of Python packaging stuff that's not Python code. How do I deal with that? Package data kind of works, but not really. Again, it depends if you're using sdist versus bdist. You have to include both an include package data and a manifest.in. You have to be very explicit in what gets included, unless you want to include everything, in which case there's kind of a glob syntax, but it really kind of sucks. Um, and then there's all these build steps and dependencies that need to get downloaded and installed and packaged in a wheel, it's kind of a pain. But Python packaging is an option. So I did some investigation on the internet and found this thing called Platter. Platter was uh, written by Armin Ronischer, really smart guy, knows what he's doing, and he describes it really well right here. Platter is a tool for Python that simply simplifies deployments on Unix servers. Great, that's what I need. I'm deploying on Unix servers. Fastest way to build and distribute Python packages in an eco ecosystem you controlled. Built-in caching, blah, blah, blah. It's basically creating almost the exact same artifact that we were already creating. That artifact is, um, in the end, it's a virtual env that gets created on your server from dependencies that are packaged with your asset as wheels, and you just move it up to the environment, untar it, run an install, and it Im installs it with all the dependencies without needing the access to the internet. So this thing was cool. I was like, oh, I'll play with this. Let's see what it actually does. Uh, and I'll demo it, sorry. So this is uh, my typical Django foo bar project, right? I've got a bunch of stuff in here. I've got Python code, I've got templates, I've got static media, all sorts of stuff. I've got configuration, I've got documentation, all the stuff that I might actually need as part of a Django project. Uh, the biggest issue here is I've got requirements, right? I need this thing. This is the most important part in my Django projects is a requirements file because it says all the stuff that needs to get installed. I can pin them. Also, because I use requirements file, I use pip, I get access to git repos that aren't necessarily in PyPy, which is a big asset to us because we have all these dependency requirements. So if I look at packaging with Python, I lose some functionality, but I can get around that. So let's assume that that works. So let me check out a branch. Can you guys see that okay? It's a little low, sorry. Uh, I'm dealing with an ugly display. So, um, so the assets that I actually need. So I create a manifest file, which says, okay, I need all this static media stuff. You need a manifest.ion file for S distributions. And so within Foo, I've got all this extra stuff that if you see this in a package, include this in my end artifact, in my actual source distribution. I also need to create a setup file, and within this I need to include package data, which is this, and that's for um, uh, binary distributions. So a thing when I actually on bdist, it actually is going to include all these things as well. Setup is atrocious. Again, Python packaging has its shortcomings, but I do have the benefit here of including my requirements file. So long as I'm not using a git repo, dash e git plus git repo egg equals blah blah blah, I can use this. I can use Python packaging. 
as soon as I get in to include repos, I can't use this anymore. So the only dependency here is I need to move all of my assets that are in repos, I need to compile them myself and put them in my local PyPy. So what happens when I run this? So this is introspecting my setup file, determining all the dependencies that it has, downloading virtual env, downloading setup tools as local eggs, then downloading all of my, or I'm sorry, uh, local wheels, then downloading all my dependencies, if they're source distributions, actually compiling them as wheels, and then putting them into sort of a cache of local wheels so I don't have to do this all the time. It's then taking all of those and put it, putting them into an actual distribution. So this artifact here is my actual source code, my project, as well as all of my dependencies. This one asset can get moved up my uh, environment hierarchy and actually get distributed, installed in that, uh, in that environment and in theory should just work. So I just ran this, it created this disk directory. Here's my asset. It's nice, it's got the name of my project, it's got a version that comes out of my setup file, which is nice, it's got the environment in which it was compiled. It looks, for all intents and purposes, just like a normal Python package. But when we untar this, we've got something a little different. It's got a data directory, which actually has all of my dependent wheels it's got this install script, which I don't really know what it does, but in theory, I should be able to run install. I mean, I do know what it does, but it just came with it. I didn't write this script, so I don't really have control over it. Um, but what it does in theory is it takes all of my dependencies and creates a virtual env and then installs my application locally. So we'll just test this really quick. Uh, oops, oh, that's fine. So again, here it is, taking this asset, um, creating a virtual env, activating that env, and then installing all the dependencies that were listed in my setup file. Here it's installed all my packages. Taking its time in this scenario. So it installed everything. If we go back out to this directory. It's a virtual env. Everything works. I can do dot slash bin manage validate. No system issues. I could do run server. So this is, it, it's my project, it's my application, and it's a package. So if I actually want access to my templates, I have to go into lib, python, site packages, foo.com. Uh, actually, it's not there, it's in, oops. It's in foo. So here's my project. I've got my static media, I've got my templates. Assuming my settings were set up correctly, I could get access to this stuff in my application. I might have to run collect static, but regardless, this is my application. It works, it's kind of cool, it's a little weird, but it works. Um, let me just blow this away, and I'll show you the new thing. Do you guys have any questions about this? Okay. So Armin has his beliefs. He's a really smart guy, and I'll put my faith in most of the things he believes, but I don't necessarily believe that Python packages are the right answer for deploying web applications. I don't think a setup.py is necessary, and I don't like putting all of my static media and templates into my site packages directory. That's just me. I have a tweet um, argument here that I had with him about this uh, very subject, and I just, I have my beliefs, he has his beliefs, and they don't align. So again, Python packaging kind of sucks. Uh, you have all these things. These are the reasons I don't want to use Python packaging. So what do I do? I wrote a new thing. And I didn't really write a new thing. I copied probably 70%. I really just forked 
platter and I modified it to do what I wanted it to do. So I had some requirements. I wanted to be able to build my asset, not just off of the source code that I had at that point in time, but I wanted to build it off of Git, right? I wanted to be able to tag a release or I wanted to pull a repo or a, I'm sorry, a, a feature branch, or I wanted to pull a specific commit and be able to build my asset off of that, not off of some arbitrary setup.py file and a version in that and then some remote branch or some local branch or something. I also wanted to use requirements because I wanted Git. I wanted to have access to all of my Git dependencies. And so I wrote platter, or I'm sorry, saucer. And again, saucer's really almost the exact same thing as, oops, build. So it's not that much different. I have the ability to pass a tree-ish command, which is just like git archives tree-ish command where, or argument where I can actually specify a tree-ish reference in my, to my git repo. So I can say master, I can say branch, I can say, again, a tag or a checkout. And what is it doing? It's doing almost the exact same thing. The main difference is it's not taking and building my source code based on the setup.py. It's taking and doing a git archive on my repo and moving all of that code into the, um, into the asset based off of the point in time that I referenced in my tree-ish. So if we now look at So it looks almost exactly the same. The big difference here is that it has this source directory. And this source directory is based off of, again, my master branch. And I actually include in the name of the, um, in the, name of the artifact the actual commit that is the, is the one that got pushed into this source code. And if I do the exact same install, it does almost the exact same thing. The big difference is that instead of installing my um, web application as a package, as a project, or I'm sorry, as a package, it installs it as a web project in a source directory within my virtual env. So here we have source, and there's my actual code. This is my repo. This is my web application with all the stuff. What did this save me? I don't really know. It's almost the exact same thing. But it meets my preferences for how I would do this. So again, these are the shortcomings of Saucer. I don't know if this is a thing. This meets my needs, and not even my needs, it just meets my preferences. It, it more closely aligns with the way I expect a project to live on a server. Um, I don't know if anybody's gonna use it. I don't really probably wanna maintain it other than for my needs. Um, and I don't know if there's any better options out there. And that's why I'm here. I, I wanted to kind of see how you guys are taking a web project and either packaging that, if packaging is even the right word, or moving it up the chain through your environments based on at least the needs that I have. I don't know if that's anybody else's needs. Maybe people are just doing git push or git pull on your production server and that's okay. Because for a lot of people that is. So thank you. And if anybody wants to offer some feedback, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Nothing in Django. Every consideration you're going to have to make is about, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was, what uh, changes to Django settings, if any, need to be made to accommodate this? And there are none in Django settings. So long as you've set up you know, your, your static DIRs and your template DIRs settings correctly, which is likely going to be relative to your settings.py or your local settings or whatever your environment-specific settings, everything's fine. Um, the big considerations around your Nginx configuration or your web server configuration, your WSGI server configuration, where these files live, how you point to them. In our environment, we always create a deploys directory for our web app, um, and then we create a symlink to the version that's active. That way, if we ever run a rollback, we just have to change a symlink and run some south migrations and do whatever. But in reality, you just change a symlink. So as long as you're pointing at the right directory, everything's fine. Um, it's just a matter of how you've configured and the decisions that you've made to get that asset up there. Does that everybody else just use git pull for the most part? Yeah? It's not ideal. It's 
it works. I, I've had clients that just do R syncs from developers' boxes up to prod and restart services, so that's not unheard of. Yeah? I, I wouldn't do that. I'd put that into, like I run all my app processes under supervisor, and so that would be part of my supervisor configuration. Um, you could, in theory, do it. I mean, you could add them uh, to your activate script if you were going to activate the actual virtual env, but we don't even activate the virtual env. We just run the uwiski process and point it at the whiskey file that's within the actual artifact. So it's not really a consideration. I would say if anybody does want to use Platter for non-web applications, I think it's the right tool. And earlier today in writing this, I kind of realized, again, I don't know if this is a thing. I might end up just using Platter. The, the shortcoming, or actually, the Platter gets me 98% of the way there, and I can, I can do a couple pull requests. The one thing it doesn't get me right now is it, it provides a post build script. So after the builds occurred, it allows me to um, run some arbitrary shell script that could do a bunch of stuff to move my directories around and to move my files however I see fit. What I want is also a post install script. So after I've run that install command, I want it to you know, restart services or I want it to um, run collect static or run my south migrations and that thing if, it, if, it, if I can get there then it'll satisfy probably all my needs and I think that's just going to be a simple pull request and Armin will take it because he already has the build script so um, so thanks let me know if you have any other questions hello